hello everyone. So we are checking your uh, remembering uh, ability. So, so you were looking at the slides and talks, right? So I have a question for you. Whosoever raises the hand first will be the one to answer. Okay. So when did the first PyCon happen? He raised the hand first. Yeah, please come here. Yeah, it's 2009. So we have PyCharm uh, one year free license to you. Congrats. All right, we'll start with our next talk. It's using Jupyter to empower the less technical by Mark Rudolph and Sriram Nagarajan. Thank you. Uh, is this too loud? All right. Uh, so my name is Mark. I'm Sriram. Uh, and today we're going to talk about using Jupyter to empower the less technical. We both work at DE Shaw, which is a global investment and technology firm with approximately a thousand employees. And everything we'll talk about today is things we do for internal clients. Is it? Sorry, one second, a little technical difficulties. Ah, there we go. Uh, so in this talk today, we hope that you'll leave with this mindset to help bridge the developer-user technological gap. Uh, we'll also hope that people have a better understanding of what does Jupyter look like in an enterprise setting. And finally, we hope that you'll come away with the idea that we can do some small things to have a big impact for our end users. So the outline of today's presentation is, first, we're going to start with understanding your users. And then Sriram will talk about our enterprise setup, followed by a range of approaches that we're currently using. And finally, I'll end with, what do we think the future holds? So how many people here feel comfortable running this Perl code? No one raised their hand. So this is what we think about when we think about less technical people running that same Perl code on the right. They see this dollar sign and this dash E, it doesn't make any sense. What is print? Is it going to go to my printer? And so less technical people see the command line, they get scared, and they, it, they just don't understand how this all works. And so I want to start with just remembering that empathy is hard. We want to try to be and get into the mindset of our end users, but it's very hard. So what can we do here? Well, we can think about user experience. And today I'll start with a sample of concerns we think about for user experience. Now this is definitely not all of the things that we talk about when we talk about UX, but some themes we want to drive home throughout the talk. So firstly, we'll talk about affordances. So what is an affordance? An affordance is something that says, is this clear to the user that this is what it does? So on the left, we have a couple doors. The horizontal crossbar says, hey, you should push me. But as you can see, this Norman door uh, from a famous book uh, says, pull, this is not a good affordance, right? You get confused, and this is not a user error, this is a designer error. Jupyter itself has lots of affordances. For example, we have a gray input box with a blinking cursor that says type. The mental model, does this match how the user thinks about the world? And so for doors, the mental model is I use this Thing, and there's a horizontal crowbar, and I push it, and it opens, and I go through it. For Jupyter, when we get to the directory structure, the, um, the folder, we see all our files. Now, this comes from the most, um, one of the original UX mental model paradigms, which is take a physical desktop full of folders and map it onto a computer, and that way users can use the same mental model they have about the world for a computer. Finally, the gulf of evaluation. Now, I think this is actually where Jupyter really d excels. So for Jupyter, the goal of evaluation is like, is the feedback clear and timely? Aside from having syntax highlighting, we can run a couple lines of code 
and quickly see the output. And so this is a really good Gulf evaluation. And so I want to remind people that this is not just for the less technical, nor for just UIs. This is about all things we design for. And user experience should come into all elements we think about. So APIs, frameworks, system design. So with that, I'll pass it on to Sri Ram. Thanks, Mark. An important facet of our firm's Jupyter deployment is this concept of a personal Jupyter server, where we run one Jupyter server per user. We initially went with an implementation of a password-based approach. This quickly ran into problems because you couldn't share this with another user. Two users accessing the same notebook ended up changing kernel state. The next implementation was a single sign-on system, which has been successful, and that's what we've been going with so far. This shares similarities with projects like Jupyter Hub and MyBinder. The reason why we care about this deeply is because it offers run as me semantics. That is, the code is actually run as you. This is in contrast with, let's say, building a website where there is a shared user or a software account which actually stands up a web process. And then you implement an authorization layer which vends out data and prevents malicious access. But with Run As Me Semantics, you, you could afford the simplification in authorization model in our setup because we also centrally control the versions of Jupyter that is deployed across the firm. We'll now talk about a range of approaches that we built in order to make it more easy for the less technical folks. So a non-technical user's first tool of choice is usually Excel. They also get their reports in the form of static tables and charts like the ones you see on screen. This is simple, but the disadvantage being it is static. You cannot do any more analysis on top of these charts and tables. We wanted a setup which lets developers build models quickly because certain models are actually difficult to build in Excel. Things like causal computations for time series. We also wanted a way to share the output of the model that you build quickly with non-technical users. You could do this in a website, but building a website is expensive. So we wanted to see how we can merge the ease of building a model with the ease of deploying a website. The Jupyter Notebook project was a perfect blend. It is actually a web application that talks to multiple uh, kernels in the backend, Python or any other language based. We thought, what if we can get Interact, the same interactivity in charts that you are used to on seeing in the web and with tables as well, sorting, filtering, and finding data in a table. What if we could bring all this power into the notebook? And we also wanted to make it very easy for our users to transition to it. Empathy is hard. The first Jupyter project we leveraged was NB Viewer. The NB Viewer renders Jupyter Notebooks as static web pages. An IPNB file is actually a JSON object which has a well-defined structure and a schema. It contains both the code as well as the output of the execution of that code. What we did was we took the output and uh, we got our in-house interactive widgets, both charts and tables, to interpret that output and show them on screen inside NB Viewer. This was great for the users because now they see the same charts and tables that they're used to seeing in other internal websites. We also have good integration with the user's file system. So uh, the file system now serves as the auth authorization mechanism. We've had some success in getting in IPy widgets also to render inside NB Viewer. Those familiar with IPy widgets, we think we kind of think of this as progressive enhancement. You author once using the IPy widgets framework, and then when you view this view the widget in J Jupyter Notebook, it actually shows up with all live data. But inside NB Viewer, 
we showed with pre-canned data. So this is an example of our NB viewer integration. You can see the URL bar uh, where the notebook is actually served by something called uh, our GIMI server, which is simply the name of our server which understands file system permissions. You can also see that this chart adheres to all the UX principles that Mark laid out a few slides back. It has affordances in the form of a burger icon. The user knows that there is some option to interact with this chart. It also has a good mental model for our end users because this is the same chart that they see on other internal websites. So they don't have to learn anything new. The gulf of evaluation is also small. It is interactive. Either the chart renders or not, and when you zoom in, there is instant feedback. While this worked for our less technical users, the main problem we had was there was still code on the screen. Also, the data had to be pre-canned. Like the, this particular IPYNB had to have data inside it for it to work. We thought, what can we do better? So a brief interlude before we move on to the uh, second approach. We'll talk about a shared implementation that we worked in-house. So the, the goal is for the user to have a men mental model of a notebook as a script. We want to retain the run as me semantics of a script so that when you run a notebook, it is run as you, similar to how what happens when you run a script. Also, access to the notebook is similar to access to the script. It does not matter what the content of the script is. The access model is different from that. So the implementation wise, because everyone is running their own personal Jupyter server, we needed a service discovery mechanism to find out where the location of a user's Jupyter server is. So we had a redirect service, something like nb.redirect.com slash dollar user, so that when I access this particular URL, it gets resolved to the location of my personal Jupyter server. The trailing part of the URL you see, this is part of the standard Jupyter API with a slight change. We authored a custom contents manager, which can look up any location of a, of a, a notebook on the file system. This is in slight contrast with the default contents manager, which limits access to only the directories under your Jupyter home directory. So the biggest takeaway from this should be that uh, there is, from the end user's perspective, there is no difference between a notebook and a script. We also put affordances in the form of share buttons and we enhanced the standard Jupyter toolbar for that. The deployment model for such a notebook is also very cheap. Uh, you can simply share these links around and we got both technical and non-technical folks using it to an equal extent. Technical folks started using this for sharing small examples and infrastructure teams use this for sharing exa examples of their core product. Uh, bug reports started coming in in form of shared uh, notebook URLs. It was great for one-off experimental projects, but then when it came to overall code quality, this left a little to be desired. We are still working internally to make this process better. Similar to a script, you can also uh, put these notebooks into production locations. You can have a deployment procedure for them. You can also schedule and run them periodically. So what can we do for the, a slightly more technically inclined user who is willing to give uh, and learn some of the technical jargon for in return for a much more rich feature set? These are typically the users who go up to a technical wiki and can copy five, six scripts and run them in sequence if you, are, if you tell them that it's really worth it. We want to do this, but still retain some of the intuitiveness that the Jupyter Notebook platform provides us. So what can, what can we provide for such users? So for such users, we offered them the complete notebook interface. With this, some of the disadvantages of NB Viewer is gone. The data is actually paged in from Python on a neat basis. So for example, in this uh, small demonstration here, 
you'll see that at any point there are only 1000 data points on the chart. As and when you interact with the chart and zoom in into a certain time interval, we fetch in more data from the uh, IPython kernel. So this is great because JavaScript components usually have a limit on how much data they can show on screen. Ma so we also had users using uh, command line scripts. Mark will talk about some approaches we did to make these much more accessible for them. So before we go into that, I want to talk a little bit about why command lines are scary to less technical users. And we'll go back to the core concepts I spoke about earlier. So you get to this command line, it's usually a white or black screen with a dollar sign on it. And a non-technical user or less technical user, what do you type there? There's not a lot of affordances. You kind of see there's a blinking cursor, so maybe I should type. But with a command line, it's pretty hard to implement clear feedback. So you can see some of the examples below, like I tried PyCon.py and it turned out I need to specify event. So then I tried to specify event and I tried foo, and it turns out that's not a valid value. And it wasn't giving me feedback very clearly in the rapid manner and constraining me in the right ways. Command lines have certain idioms like, do I use dash dash or dash for parameters? And so you could see that especially less technical users, they get scared of this. To be honest, command lines more like programming than it is a real good user interface. And so we asked, what if we could reuse all the stuff we're doing in command line and make a UI out of it? So what if we could extend opt parse or arg parse from Python and simply generate UIs? No or minimal extra work to the developer, but a lot of, a lot of benefits to our less technical end users. And so we're seeing a, lie, or a recorded example of this right here, and we'll go into why this is really powerful. Oh, yeah. So it really reduced a lot of the command line UX issues. So the mental model, right? So now the users are seeing a form here, right? Most of the scripts we write are simply form entry. You pass a bunch of parameters, they're not interactive scripts, they run for a while, they give you output. And so we just made it into a form, and users are happy to see that. There's affordances here. We see a, we see a box for dropdown. It's, it's very clear that they've seen, these, they've seen these paradigms before that you click and select. The goal of, of execution is very clear there because you, it just makes it harder to get it wrong. When you click on where you see the number 10, you'll get an up and down arrow, and that says, oh, these are numbers. And if I even tried to type something like a letter, it would delete it. And so we've even done a couple little things to make it feel a little bit better. So when you click submit, it has a timer, and it just shows that it's trying to make progress. If it's really making progress, it doesn't matter. It's one of these illusions we give to make our users more comfortable. So I want to show you that this was not a lot of work and that we did not customize the UI for this talk. Now, this is the same command line script we saw before, except I added some function called get parser. And this uses an option parser, which is the D. Shaw version of opt parse, um, extended a little bit. And so you could see our options map very clearly to the UI. So our choices map, map to the dropdown, the add option count of type int. Oh, it's of type int. Let me make sure the user can only put in ints. And this constraint really makes this a powerful UI. You're getting the users out of command line and shifting the amount of users who are able to use your scripts. For the developer, this is easy. All I had to do is refactor my code to isolate my parser, return it somewhere, and then I can run it in a script. We've even gone so far to make custom content managers so you don't even need to write those first two lines of the Jupyter Notebook that says import script newly and then run my script. So from here, I want to end with a little bit about the future. Like, where are we going with this, and where do we think this should go? So the first question I want to ask is, how can we make Jupyter Notebooks better, have a better UX for our less technical? So Sri Ram mentioned before, and, I, and we'll drive this home, showing less technical people code really scares them. They don't understand what it says. They see it on screen, and they, and they think it's too complex. If, as you see in the uh, animation, you simply use the Jupyter plugin to hide code, this makes it feel that much better. They don't, they, don't, they don't get scared. There's been other approaches out there, like Jupyter Dashboard, which we tried and tried, and it's a really great project in theory, but in practice, we still found too many cases that our users got stuck in. The failure modes were unclear. 
you still sort of need to understand how a notebook works. So how do we increase adoption? Right, we want to shift more and more of our less technical users to using these personal Jupyter notebook servers. So we need to get rid of this idea that we have to run all the cells. We could auto run notebooks for them, but there are a lot of security considerations there. We can't auto run everything. There's definitely a class of problems we believe we can. But what if we just put in a big button at the top that says run this notebook on, my, on your behalf? And if we did that, the user might not be so scared of using our essentially a website. We can also think about just incrementally improving the notebook. So we talked initially that said, hey, if you give a user enough value, they're going to try something that maybe they're a little bit uncomfortable with. So we talked about going from static images to zoomable charts, especially paging and data. Now this is a huge value to the user, and a lot of users will say, fine, I'll learn how to use this notebook thing because I can do things I couldn't do before. So why can't we just keep going in this direction? Why don't we add pivot tables? Or what about cross-filter? And JupyterLab Voyager is in beta, and just an example on the right. So if we start to add these sort of widgets, we'll get more adoption because there'll just be so much more value to learning how to use Jupyter. But that being said, we can just make the UX easier for users to transition into. We can reduce the fear of running all, but there's other things that websites do, right? We all joined Slack for this conference, and when you first get to Slack, there's some, sort of, uh, there's some sort of tour that teaches you how to use the UI. Why can't we include this for everyone? Developers, non-technical people um, will all benefit from this idea that we can adopt common UX principles and make it easier for beginners. We talked about hiding code on screen, but what about reducing friction points and error modes? If there are less chances for error in the notebook or the errors are clearer, that is even more powerful for our less technical audience. Developers will see an error, they'll Google it, they'll figure it out, they might be grumpy about it, but they won't leave your product. The more errors that your Jupyter Notebook shows and the more cases that it can fail in unclear ways, you'll just lose that person. They won't come back so fast. Finally, what if there were new ways to share a notebook? What if there were ways that I could use you know, Google uh, Docs style sharing and I click it on a notebook and then I say, hey, share this with Sriram or these specific people. We can have a better security model here in a very clear sharing ecosystem. Because sharing sort of feeds back on itself and we'll have a lot of power there. So those are some ideas for incremental approaches. Nothing there should feel groundbreaking. It should just feel like, oh, we're taking the status quo and making it better. And so next I want to talk about some ideas we're playing with to sort of go generational. Like, what is the next step for Jupyter Notebook? So let's go back to the principles of a Jupyter Notebook. An IPython notebook is simply a, a JSON object. And so we can see on the left, the source says one plus one, I ran the cell, apparently I've ran it eight times, and uh, the output is two. And so this is a lot of data to describe exactly what's going on. And why don't we process this data and put it in other environments that aren't Jupyter Notebook? So NB Viewer is a good example of this. An NB Viewer is not a Jupyter Notebook, but a re-implementation of certain characteristics. The NB Viewer does not have the kernel. And so what if we could use this IPython Notebook file, and instead of just rendering for the web, we became, render, we became environment aware. We could think about sticking with pre-canned data, as we've already done with NB Viewer, but we could also think about paging in data from some sort of service. And so this is the concept I'd like to present as what if the Jupyter Notebook was a report? So don't get rid of MB Viewer. It works well. Keep using it. But our users don't want this same thing in just the web page. A lot of our users want data in email. And so why can't our charts become static images and our tables HTML tables? And this is just about defining this data in a clear way in your IPython output and then parsing it and re-rendering for the right environment. People want data in PDFs, so let's give it to them. We can already embed widgets and other websites through Jupyter, but there's still a little ways to go there. So if you've ever thought about or used Dash, we can think about we're stealing some of the really, sharing some of the real same concepts here, but a little bit more of a universal approach. And I'll say that this is definitely a better UX for developers, because now we can generate reports and different things, and they can stay in the environment they know and love. Like our developers love Jupyter, they 
generally don't want to leave it for most things. You can make a report incrementally. You see the output in real time. So you make that first chart, you check it. Does it look right? Is, is it perfect? You're not like running some script, generating, a, generating the whole report, and then going in and editing each feature. And so we're trying to keep users in the same environment. And the idea here is really just make the Jupyter Notebook not just the end stage, but an intermediary stage. And you can read a nice article on Medium uh, by Netflix about how they've also adopted Jupyter Notebook as sort of this central unit. So to recap what we talked about today is first, what does Jupyter look like in an enterprise? And the key concept here was we can run one Jupyter server per person. And, and when combining that with NB Viewer, we can go a very, very long way. We talked about ideas to help bridge the developer, uh, less technical person divide. And there's really not a single approach for people. There's really a range of people, and not everyone's going to use everything we talked about today. And we hope that we've encouraged you to think more about this, to think about like, OK, can I use Jupyter widgets to help replace some things that are, people are struggling with, like command line? How can we apply UX principles? And the idea here is we want to think about making small changes to have a really large impact. Like our sharing solution is a couple hundred lines of code, and that has gone a really long way. Script NUI is a couple thousand lines of code. We're not talking about really, really big projects. We're talking about having empathy with our less technical users and sort of getting into their shoes and really thinking about why are they scared of certain products and how can we bridge that divide, give them some of the power that we've seen from Jupyter, the fact that we now have JavaScript running on top of Python and combining the two in interesting ways. And so I leave you with that. I leave you with the idea that we should be thinking more about our end users and about the less technical and how we can help them do some of the things that we love. So with that, we'll take any questions. Uh, thank you for the informational talk. Uh, so I understand the use case, it's for um, developers and also for non-technical folks. So like as a developer, when we're working on code, we also try to have a, put it in revision control, like Git or something. So does this work with that kind of a workflow? So yeah, I'll answer that one. So we find that there's a lot of work to be done to make Jupyter Notebooks a little bit more like normal source co control. And so there are some great programs out there. There are things like NB Dime, which will help you diff the um, output and input cells, and you can choose exactly what to diff. Uh, we even have pre-commit hooks to help check that maybe this notebook, you should never save the output to make our diffs a little better. But I won't lie and say that it's just as good as normal source control, but there are a lot of things that we're doing and that the open source community is doing to help kind of bridge that divide. Hi, uh, you mentioned that it is more universal as compared to Dash. Uh, can you explain a bit how? Yeah, so the goal of Dash is to build web apps quickly. Uh, our goal is more to uh, build a product that can render everywhere, not necessarily on the web. So we just have an abstract representation of what you want to build, and then we take that representation and uh, render it based on the environment. By environment, we mean, okay, do you want to render it in Outlook? Then there is an output specific, Outlook specific renderer. If you want to render it in a PDF, there is a PDF specific renderer. Hi, uh, great talk. So I just had one question. So uh, when you say that uh, you have a notebook which is shared across multiple users, so is it the same notebook that's shared and people are running it as themselves? So how do you have, like, if one person is running it and there's one more person doing the same thing? So that's a, really that good, that's a really good question. And that was one of the things we struggled with at first. Um, and this is actually why we went to the personal Jupyter server, wrote our own custom uh, contents manager. And so the problem you, you point out is true. If you share a password, you have kernel collision and people are going to run it. And so what we did is we had a, a custom context manager and that we changed the URL um, and I think we have the URL on some slides back here, which actually make this a little clearer. No. So, uh, the slides aren't up. So, uh, we changed the URL so that everyone's Jupyter server would have one kernel running per shared notebook. So the path we used is changed to the full file path. And because we did the whole redirect thing, we first were on that user's server, 
And then the notebook API said, open up this file. And instead of reading from the root directory of your Jupyter server, we used our whole file system, look up the file, and run that as its own separate kernel. And so every user runs the notebook once, and when that notebook opens, it's read only, because we don't want you to even have, even if you had permissions to write, to write there, you can make a copy for yourself and edit. And so we really gave that a lot of thought, because that was a really a big problem. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. So my question is, one of, in one of your slides, I have seen that you have imported uh, some DJS. So what kind of library uh, you have used you know, uh, to showcase that UI? So DJS stands for uh, DE Shaw JavaScript. And so DE Shaw JavaScript is our attempt to uh, bring a lot of the stuff we have from the web here, and so this goes back to the UX things, and we've given this a lot of thought. It's like, why are we using high charts in here? And the high charts is a great open source library, but a commercial license. And so what we wanted to do was have a consistent user experience across all applications. And so what that meant is our tables and our charts we were using in the web, we wanted to embed in notebooks. And so we spend a lot of effort coming up with APIs to reuse these same widgets that we use in the web and embed them in the notebook. And so we've convinced users to say, hey, we don't need matplotlib anymore. I get this interactive output as my default render for lots of different things. And so DJS is our attempt to wrap various internal libraries that we use on the web and bring them to Python. Uh, so is there any provision to you know, plug in my own custom uh, you know, front-end component into this uh, NB viewer? Yeah, so the technology we use to power this is open source. We're not... We didn't invent much in how to get these widgets to render an NB viewer or things like that. So you can definitely write your own widgets that are, you can render in both places. Uh, both NB viewer, Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab, and you should be able to render everywhere. And this is something the open source community has taken as a very serious and important thing. Okay, thanks.